All right. So in Joel 2, um, fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, and the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For if he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause it to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore you to you the years that the locust had eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God that had dwelt wondrously with you, dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed, and ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. Right on. In the back, making up for lost time. None of us can say that we have no regrets. Often we're led down paths of bad choices, some paths longer than others, which can have a lingering effect on the mind, body, and soul. A friend of mine spent a number of years living a life of alcohol and drug abuse, but God did an amazing work in his life and he's recently celebrated 25 years of being free from substance abuse. Now he runs a successful business, devoted wife, uh, he has a devoted wife, he has children that love Jesus, and he has a passion to reach out to others who are in the ditch of life. And he serves as a wise and loving mentor uh, in the rescue operations of their lives. God never gives up on us. Even if we've made poor choices in the past that have left us with regret, we can choose how we live now. We can choose to continue destructive living, simply wallow in regret, or we can run to Christ believing that he has the ways to restore the years that the swarming locust has eaten. When we repent, repentantly seek his healing and freeing power, he is merciful. While some consequences from the past may remain, we can be confident that God has a good and glorious future for those who trust in him. Amen. Uh, Lord, it is with humble and grateful hearts that we come to you and lie all that we have in the been in the past at your feet. Take us as we, uh, as we are and make something beautiful of our lives that brings glory to you. God never gives up on making something beautiful out of our lives. Right on. Well, and as usual, ties in pretty well with um, kind of what I've got here to review um, or where we'll be today. Uh, the Book of Numbers isn't necessarily a book that I spend a whole lot of time in. Uh, it's not one I've studied in great detail, um, but an interesting book nonetheless. Um, what we're going to look at today is uh, a story involving a, a guy named Balaam. I don't know how you guys are with Balaam. But uh, Nelson's Bible Dictionary states that Balaam is a curious mixture of good and evil. Sounds like about my first 25 years of being saved, I believe. Um, he is a definitely an interesting character, and I believe God uses him to show Christians how the world can keep us enticed, entangled, and suppress us, keeping us from the full potential that God wants for us. And... You know, at, as we begin in Numbers 21, which if you want to open your Bibles, that's where, uh, that's where, where we'll kind of start. Now at this point in Numbers, Israel, of course still being led by Moses, is at the tail end of their 40-year wandering in, their, in the wilderness. It should have only lasted about 11 days. Now, keep in mind, to this point in the journey, some of the things that they have come across. Not only did they exit 40 years you know, of slavery and bondage, uh, part of the Red Sea, they went through the ten plagues. Uh, 
they're in the wilderness. They start talking about how they want to go back to be slaves. They want to run back to the world. They want to be in bondage. They want to go to Egypt, right? Uh, then you've got Aaron and Miriam. You know, they're rebelling against Moses. I mean, you get, imagine being Moses just thinking, I mean, come on. Like, like when are they going to straighten up, right? Even my own brother and sister rebelling against me. And then you got the golden calf that they put together. Uh, at this point, God has sentenced, uh, at this uh, journey through the wilderness, God had sentenced this generation to, to not, the first generation to not make the promised land. Then you got the Levites, they rebel. You got people complaining about the manna and the lack of water. And then Israel rebels again. So God sends snakes down to bite the people. They start to die. Then God has uh, Moses take up a fiery serpent on a staff so that all that look at that staff are healed. That symbol is still used today by a lot of insurance companies and hospitals. Um, so it's good that there's maybe a little God and a hidden message there in, in those uh, symbols. But we've had a lot that's, that's really been, been taking place over these, these 40 years, and they, they basically just keep getting themselves into worse and worse trouble. So, you know, as you go through uh, in 21, verses 10 through 35, Israel and their large caravan has been making their way through the wilderness. And they've basically been defeating any people group that has gotten in their way, right? If you're not going to let us come set up the tabernacle, set up our camp as we are making our way to the promised land, and you want to give us pushback, then God would bless them, and they would defeat their enemies, and they would move on. So, you know, if you can imagine a, a, a caravan, as far as the eye could see, coming your way, and you're a leader, you're a little worried. I mean, these guys are wrecking shop. Everything's, you know... The stories you can probably imagine, you know, from the parting of the sea and being led out of bondage and, and them taking over uh, areas, uh, groups, territories as they're moving their way to the promised land, they probably had quite a reputation coming their way, if, if, you were, if they were coming your way, I mean. So, at the, the, uh, basically on the edge or right there at the end of their journey leads us to kind of what we're, where we're going to be today. So they come find their way to Moab. All right. So you've got obviously the Moabites live there and they're led by a king there named Balak. So you essentially have Israel coming, setting up right in the plains of, uh, of, uh, Moab and, uh, and that basically leads us into Numbers 22, 1 through 5. And here what we find is Balak is very, very worried. He just saw what Israel did to the uh, Amorites. They killed the king of the Amorites and his son. So that doesn't sound too promising for Balak of what's possibly coming his way here. If you can imagine kind of looking on the bluff down at this what is a giant cross? I know a lot of us have gone through the tabernacle study and, you know, where you set up, uh, when they set the tabernacle up and then the camps accordingly, it's, it's in the shape of a cross. So you're looking down on a bluff, uh, you see this people group, this very, very large group, a number you can't count. They're known for just taking over territories. Um, and uh, they're right at your footstep. And, 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 and Balak's worried. He should be worried, right? So, uh, he's essentially right now wondering what is in any way, shape, or form could I potentially do to, to protect myself and to protect my, uh, my kingdom here. So, a couple of things to note. You know, Balak, like I said, knows the stories. Uh, one of the things that kind of surprised me when I first read this is what popped in his mind is Balaam. So you have a, a, a man that isn't a godly man in Balak, and he thinks of a would-be prophet who's also considered a pagan sorcerer in Balaam. And what he wants is, is he wants Balaam. He's going to seek Balaam out to have him come and put a curse on Israel. Now, my thought was, 
why would Balaam even consider something like this? If he's a guy, if he's a man that talks to God, why in the world is he dealing with people? Why does he even have a reputation? How does Balak even know his name and, and know that he's willing to potentially, for the right price, come put a curse on people? So, you know, this should kind of draw into question ba Balaam's character and, and uh, kind of begins to open your eyes on, on maybe what, what is he really about? Is he known for being a sellout? Right? So, this now brings us in where I'm going to read in Numbers 22, 6 through 35. So this is Balak here. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me. So he's basically sending this message. He's giving this message to his guys to take to Balaam. Balaam doesn't live real close. It's a pretty good journey. And what he's saying is, curse me, this people, for they are too mighty for me. Free adventure I shall prevail that we might smite them and that I might drive them out of the land. For I wot that he whom thou blessest is blessed. And he whom thou curses is cursed. So he's clearly got some sort of power. He does have some connection with God, and he is known for that. And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards, right, the monetary gain of divination and in their hand. And they came unto Balaam and spake to him the words of Balak. And he said unto them, Lodge here this night, and I will bring you word again, as the Lord shall speak unto me. And the princes of Moab abode with Balaam. And God came unto Balaam and said, What men are these with thee? And Balaam said unto God, Balak the son of Zippor, king of Moab, had sent them unto me, saying, Behold, there is a people that come out of Egypt, which covereth the face of the earth. Come now, curse me them. Peradventure, I shall be able to overcome or overpower them and drive them out. And God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. And Balaam rose up in the morning and said unto the princes of Balak, Get ye into your land, for the Lord refuses to give me permission or give me leave to go with you. And the princes of Moaz rose up, or Moab rose up, and they went and uh, went unto Balak and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. Now, second time, number two, right? Division's coming. And Balak sent yet again uh, princes more and more honorable than they, so of higher authority than the people that have even sent before. I imagine these are the people that are literally right below them. And they came unto Balaam and said unto him, Thus saith Balak, the son of Zippor, Let nothing... I pray thee, hinder thee from coming on to me. For I will promote thee unto very great honor, and I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come therefore, I pray thee, curse me these people. And Balaam answered, Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God, to do less or more. Therefore I pray you, tarry ye also here this night, that I may know what the Lord will say unto, unto me more. And God came unto Balaam at night, and he said unto him, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I say, uh, I shall say unto thee, that shall thou do all right so up to this point right they've made two journeys now pretty good journeys pretty far journeys if you know where aram is versus where moab is in the map i almost printed it out and handed it out but did not uh but it's a decent journey it certainly isn't just a one-day uh walk so he's he's essentially sending to try to pay off balak to come and and essentially put a hedge of protection around him so obviously with this huge group he's scared he's concerned and he's doing whatever he possibly can so first god says no these people come back in fact god even goes into who who are these people and why are they with you i wonder if sometimes that's what he does when we're with people of the world and we're not witnessing we're not being a light and we're partaking in these worldly adventures that we shouldn't be taking a part in uh he's going to call that into question 
So he gives them specifics on what he needs to do. If they come for you, then rise up and go with them. Right? Well, it doesn't happen. So Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass or saddled his donkey and went with the princes of Moab. And God anger, God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his donkey, and the two servants were with him. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand. And the ass turned aside, or the donkey turned aside, out of the way, and went into the field. And Balaam uh, smote the donkey. He's basically hitting the donkey to turn onto the way. So that's the first time that... Uh, that the angel of the Lord put a block in there. But then the angel of the Lord stood in the path of the vineyards, a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. Essentially, if you can imagine a corridor, and there's not really anywhere to go. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself into the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall, and he started beating her again. So he got the second time. He's just, just not letting them through. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place, essentially trapping the donkey where there was no way to turn either to the, to the right hand or to the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she fell under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled. And he just absolutely started beating the heck out of this donkey with his staff. And the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said unto Balaam, what have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? And Balaam said unto the donkey, Because thou hast mocked me, I would there I, I would there were a sword in my hand, for now I would kill thee. So at this point, God literally is having a donkey talk. And instead of being absolutely wowed that an animal is talking to you. He's literally so angry because he's being kept from what his fleshly desires are that he looks past that and says, you're actually lucky that I don't have a sword because if I did, I'd basically end you, right? So, so the conversation continues. And the donkey says on the Balaam, uh, am I not thy donkey? All right, upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine until this day? Oh, uh, was I ever accustomed to do so unto thee? And he said, No. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw an angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn and in his hand, and he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. This is Balaam, that is. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thy donkey these three times? Behold, I went to withstand thee, because thy way is perverse before me. And the donkey saw me, and turned from me these three times. Unless she had turned from me, surely now also I had slain thee, and saved her alive. And Balaam said unto the angel of the Lord, that I have sinned, for I knew not that thou stoodest in the way against me. Now therefore, if it displease thee, displease thee I will get me back again. And the angel of the Lord said unto Balaam, Go with the men, but only the word that I shall speak unto thee, that thou shalt speak. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. Alright, so let's unpack a little bit of this here. So, essentially, 22, 6 through 20, you know, Balak's sending the elders of Moab and Midian. Uh, they're bringing rewards and payments for Balaam to come to Moab to curse Israel. At first, God tells him not to go, so Balaam tells him to go back. God won't give him permission. Then Balak of Siani. Now he's sending more to him. He's basically making him an offer he can't refuse, which is what the world can certainly do for us or to us from time to time, as it seems. So he sends his princes, his more honorable men, than sent before and he adds to it, to promote thee to very great honor on top of the money and wealth. 
And Balaam goes to God, goes to God again. But this time, God tells him, If the men come to thee, if the men call, uh, come call thee, rise up and go with them. But you are only to say what I say. The problem with this, and I know I've dealt with this in my time, is, is that you look at what you can gain. You look at the rewards, the prestige, whatever it might be. And you end up maybe going down a road that Balaam did. He woke up and with great haste saddled his donkey and met up with the princes of Moab. Now I can imagine him laying there in bed, right? Kind of like when you got something big going on or maybe a big decision and maybe you slept good, but you end up waking up at about 6 in the morning, right? And he's just laying there in bed thinking about all this money he can have, thinking about the happiness, the fruitful life. May not be from the right source, but this is what he's going through in his mind. And they're not coming. And they're not knocking on the door. It's almost like when you're waiting for that phone call for that awesome job, right? Or like Bill waiting for mom to say yeah when she said God didn't tell me as he brings up from time to time. Right? You're waiting for that. And it's like it's not happening. And you're like, I, I, he's going to tell me when I'm on my way, right? I, I'm going to go ahead and go. This is too good to be true. Like, I, this, is, this is my path. This is my destiny. I know this is right. He wants me to prosper, right? Well, that's what we read, that, that, that God says, you know, uh, Christians shouldn't be poor, and they shouldn't be in poverty, and they shouldn't be without love. So when you get a little bit of taste of that, you know, you want to run to it because you're like, this is what he's telling me. But maybe you just haven't gotten that in your spirit and you haven't gotten that in your heart. Well, and this is exactly what happened to Balaam. He, he didn't have that message sent to him. But what he did think about is he thought about the game. And that superseded everything. So he got his stuff together. I can imagine him packing it like, like a bug out, right? He is, he is getting his stuff and he is hitting the road. Maybe they didn't hear from him, Right. So they decided to make their journey back. Now that doesn't mean that God wouldn't have used them to come, use Balaam to come down the road and do something different, but Balaam took, it, Balaam took it into his own hands, like we as Christians can do sometimes. And he went against God's will. He went against what God had told them. Waiting wasn't an option anymore. So in 23, we see that God's anger is kindled against him. God can't lie. If God tells you that you have got to do it this way and you choose not to do it, he would literally be like a man and be a liar if he allowed you to get rewarded. So this, this cannot happen. You've got to, there's got to be some form of correction. So angel of the Lord appeared. This is the pre-incarnate Christ Himself. Jesus Christ is standing there, if you can imagine, in battle armor, with a sword, drawn, and He isn't going through. Now, the donkey starts acting strange, right? But you've got to understand that in this time, specifically in Mesopotamia region, when animals acted strange, it was to be a sign from God. I think about like even to this day, my little dog Chloe, when the thunderstorm's coming, right? Uh, sometimes even before the thunder starts, she gets back in a corner. Like in this weird spot in the kitchen, you know, where it, we got a U-shaped kitchen. She's sitting right here in the corner. Not like in her cage that has a blanket on it and a bed. But she's in there and she's just shaking. And it's not even raining yet, right? So, so clearly this still carries on. But, but at that time in that region when, when animals were acting weird, especially if you think that you're a man of God or you know God, and clearly Balaam did because God's talking to him, even though he's maybe also known as a, as a pagan sorcerer or one foot in the world, one foot uh, in, in the kingdom there. But he's so clouded from his lust that is just filling his mind that he is not seeing the obvious things that he should be seeing. Just like as Christians, sometimes, you know, you, you look at someone and you're like, why are you acting like an idiot? Like, don't you see that that is not going to be good for you, right? But then you also got to watch that because if you're pointing out the splinter in one's eye, you know, you've got the plank in your own you've got to be careful of. But... 
But sometimes it's the obvious things that aren't so obvious because we're just clouded. And that's, that's clearly what's happening here. So even with his you know, clouded judgment, we clearly see that his focus was personal gain, the payment of wealth, the authority, the fame. So you know, when, when the donkey saw first, he ran into the field. He didn't want any of Jesus. Like, he didn't want any Jesus at all. He's like, oh, no. No, I'm not going to sit there and continue to get, get uh, potentially beat, right? And, uh, but Balaam didn't, didn't see it, didn't listen, and he began to hit the donkey. I often wonder, and think about it as we continue to go through it, is the donkey really the Holy Spirit? Are we Balaam? And obviously Jesus is standing there. Is it that way with the Holy Spirit? When we ask for a message and then something happens and we say, well, I've got to keep asking. And I've got to ask more. And then something happens. And you're like, well, God's making me stronger. Is He? Or is He sending you a message and you're not getting the answer that you want? So you continue to beat your head against the wall. And you continue to fight the Holy Spirit. Until the Holy Spirit finally goes, I, I don't want any of this, Jesus, right? He's, he's our communicator. He communicates to us and then communicates back, right? He's like, I don't know what to do with this guy. And then I think that's maybe what the donkey is here. I don't know for certain, but we'll see what the Holy Spirit tells us as we continue to go through this. So now... Balaam gets the donkey back on track. And we see here in 22, 24 through 30, that now they're coming up through a vineyard, right? He must have ran off in the field good. Now they're coming through a vineyard. Next thing you know, here comes Jesus. Here comes the angel of the Lord to block again. Now the donkey's got a wall on both sides. He doesn't have anything to do, right? So then he smashes Balaam's foot against the wall. Now Balaam's really mad, right? Like, I can't believe it. What's going on? Like, why, why aren't we moving through? What is stopping me? Still completely clouded from the judgment. This should be a no-brainer at this point. But the division is continuing. So Jesus traps the donkey. So it can't move. Can't move to the left. Can't move to the right. I actually used to listen to uh, a pastor, James McDonald, that always had that song. To the left, to the right, uh, I will not go. This is basically it. That it's, it's staying on that path. That, that wall was put there, I believe, as a, as a sign that though we want to run off into the wilderness and be that lone sheep that's, that's out there for the wolves to get, that sometimes God is going to put those walls to keep us on that path. Though we're trying to stay on that path, we don't. So He has to put barriers in. Because He can't wrangle us in. So He's got to trap us in a scenario. Right? Maybe that, that scenario is, is you're, you're going to be trapped here and go through this, this, this trial, this tribulation, until you fall on your knees, until you come to me, until you surrender to me, right? He's going to put those walls in, and that's a scenario that we're dealing with here. And sometimes we, we do get our foot smashed. Sometimes the Holy Spirit, I think, has to knock us around a little bit to try to wake us up. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. He continues to beat the donkey. He continues to move down the path. He doesn't see the signs and he's, he's forging ahead. Now I bet the wealth, I bet Satan is just getting on him. The wealth and the prestige. and He's just thinking about, it's almost like if I did this, I would have a hundred million dollars. All my problems would go away. Everything would be great. I could buy anything I wanted, right? That's what he's got going in his mind, I believe. And he continues on. He beats it. He's trying to get the donkey going. The Lord opens the donkey's mouth and he starts talking. Why'd you hit me three times? And Balaam's raging. He literally doesn't even know how absurd he sounds talking to a donkey. Like, I liked Mr. Ed, but come on, this is like real. Like a donkey's talking. This didn't happen all the time. And they're literally arguing. The donkey's telling them, I've never done this before. And that's why I think I get a little bit of the Holy Spirit feeling, right? The Holy Spirit's saying, I've never let you down. It's your stupid decisions that have, right? I'm, I'm giving you the light. 
I'm telling you the way to go. Have I ever let you down if you did what I told you to do, what God told you to do, what you read what God told you to do, the signs that you saw that you should have went this route? And he can only say, you honestly never steered me wrong. And I believe if we are wholeheartedly looking at the Holy Spirit, that should be our same response as well. So, this exchange takes place. I've never done this to you. I can't control it. This is just going to happen. And finally, it leads us down to 31. In 31, in Jesus, Numbers 22, 31, Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing there in the way, and his sword drawn, and bowed down, and fell flat on his face. Eventually we get broke when we're going down a path that we shouldn't go down. And you generally are always going to find yourself on your knees. If not, you're going to live a tormented life. God does not lie. Right? There's some great things that are still to come in this, this story here. And there's some more bad things to come as well. But one thing is, is that that is always the best place to start when you feel that something's holding you back, is on your knees and on your face, repenting. Asking for guidance. Even with a guy like Balaam. The angel of the Lord turns, says on to him, Why are you beating your donkey? It's almost like, why are you mad at the Holy Spirit, right? Why are you acting like you, that He ain't communicating on your behalf and He's not giving you what you want? It's because it's not what God wants. That's why He's not giving you what you want. That's why you're not getting what you want. The way that he went, the way that he's going is perverse. Now, I ran in the world for 25 years. Yeah, I was saved, but I knew what was perverse and what wasn't. We've all dealt with those things. You know, even when a guy like, you know, Pastor David Jeremiah says that he still sins daily. Look, we all do. But we know what's, what's perverse and when we're going the wrong way. So, where we end up getting to here is that Jesus opened up his eyes and he starts to begin to, to tell him the way to go. What do we have in our life that we need to move from, that we need to go on to a different direction? What are we hanging on to? Sometimes I think about being a Cowboys fan. They're never going to win a Super Bowl again. Why am I hanging on to that? <laughs> We will become the new Cleveland Browns. It's just a fact. It's just going to be the case, right? But in all seriousness, you know, it's, is it relationships with the world that, that keeps us, you know, from going into the world and being a light onto the world? I know for me, for years, I certainly might have a, an appearance around Christians, but what about when I would go to my families? And I'd take that time and I'd have some beers and I'd have some drinks and my wife and kids would go home and I would stay there and hang out. I'm not at a bar. I'm not out crowsing around. I'm not picking ladies up. I'm doing something worse. I'm, I'm putting myself in a position to not be a light onto the world, right? I'm putting myself in a position to now be hesitant, to be scared and you know, I don't know about you guys, but there's been times where I've been drinking and witnessing, right? That ain't good. I mean, that yeah, is there truth in it? Sure there is. But are you taking this serious? If you can't handle not, not going to, to the drink when, when you're around certain gatherings and being that light, I mean, that's where they can call us hypocrites. And then you got, you're going down that path. I decided to make that change a couple of years ago. I'm still not perfect by any means. I've got ways to go, but it certainly was put in my heart. You know, do we go into the to the world and partake in worldly things? Like 
drinking, drugs, riotous living, envy, sexual immorality, idol worship, movies and music, that, that's very bad content. The sexual immorality one always drives me a little bit crazy. You always have, you'd have one person that let's say, uh, you know, is a heterosexual, is a male, loves women, and, and he'll sit there and talk about how it's wrong to be, uh, to be gay, right, and to sleep with the same person, or to be a lesbian, or whatever the other things that are going on now with it. But yet at the same time, literally the last two weeks, he slept with two different women. Like, it's the same thing. Sexual immorality is anything outside of marriage. It's just the truth, but we've softened it. We've softened the blow. It's been softened for kids. It's allowed the doors to open up in schools and everywhere else to allow this riotous living. Be your own God. As long as it makes you happy, do it. Uh, it it's pretty bad out there. It's a real perverse world. What are we doing to contribute to that as Christians? What are we contributing to Satan's world? Are we able to open up our eyes and see the things that maybe we are leaving impressions on friends, family, other Christians? Is it clothes? Is it, is it a material thing? Is it a person that we're in a relationship with that isn't open to being a follower of Christ? But man, they're attractive. Man, they've got some money. What is it? Is it a job that's easy that doesn't push us to be better, to provide for more God's kingdom and for our family? Is it God calling you to do something for His kingdom, but you're frightened to be bold and put yourself out there? The last one really gets to me. <clears throat> I see most of all of you in this church doing what seems like is so much for God. And I'm thinking to myself, holy cow, I need to step up. We might be small, but I believe we're very mighty. And I know there's a lot that people do here, and it motivates me. There's a lot of lost souls out there that are going to hell. And why am I scared to share more? Right? There should be a bunch of people in here that are sinners. And I'm not saying we need to be a mega church. I'm just saying there needs to be more sinners that don't know Jesus in here. It's not my goal to bring people from other churches. Sure, if they need to get with a church that teaches out of the Bible and they're not in one now, by all means come. But we need those that are lost. That's our calling. That's the Great Commission. And that's what I struggle with that I need to be more bold about. Whether it's a track ministry whether it's watching videos on Kirk Cameron stopping people in the street and asking questions to let them know that they have not been good enough to go to heaven, whatever it might be. Doing what we talked about earlier, just sending messages of bills, sending them to our Facebook page. Check us out on Sunday before you come. You can see we're not a bunch of weirdos, right? But it's tough. It's tough to, to avoid the world because you are looked at as a weirdo. I mean... You believe some blood's going to take you to eternity, right? You believe if you followed some words that were laid down thousands and thousands of years ago that you're going to be blessed? They don't understand that supernatural power. And we cloud that sometimes. We cloud that and, and we don't allow people to be able to see that true light. And that's what should keep us on that straight path. Keeping God happy, making God smile. What are we doing to, to do that, right? So, we are now through the story of, you know, Balaam's been summonsed. He said no. He went out of his own lust. He didn't do it the way that God said to do it. He's thrown himself off the timeline that I believe God had initially planned for the scenario. But God's still working with it. And even though he stopped him, he used the donkey to, to, to get him to uh, uh, not be able to move any further. Now he's, he's back on the path of, okay, I'm still going to let you go. Right? It's like, hey, last time you went over there and you partied with him, 
I'm gonna smack you down a little bit, but next time when you go over there, now you're not gonna party and you're gonna be a light onto the world. And they're gonna start to see a changed person in you, right? He's given them another chance. So he goes and he finally reaches Balak, right? Balak's probably going, what the heck, man? Like I sent for you twice? I'm giving you everything that you could even possibly think about having that you don't have now. And I need you to curse these people. What's been going on? And this basically takes us to 2236 through 2330. And I'm not going to read all of it, but I'm, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit here. That, you know, after Balaam's kind of railing on him a little bit, saying, hey, what's, what's taking you so long, man? I'm giving you this. I'm giving you that. You know, I'm paying for everything for you. Come to me. Come, come, come to me and, and, and let's get this taken care of, right? So Balaam tells Balak, hey man, I'm only going to be able to do and say what God tells me to say. If God says bless, uh, bless these people, then, then they're going to get blessed. And if God says curse, then, then, he, then they're going to get cursed. Like I, I can't do anything about it. Like I just had a dang donkey talking to me, right? The Lord just appeared. Like, these are things that don't happen all the time. I don't know if you know, but I'm a bit of a shady character, right? I mean, this is kind of what he's saying. Like, like I'm swinging both ways, and I just saw the Lord, right? So, it's kind of like when, when we get fired up, and we're witnessing, and we're doing some things, and we're getting blessed, and we're like, you know, we're on fire, right? Like, we're not, we, that boldness kicks in, and we're, we, we kick it into action for the Lord. So, so he, he explains this to him. So Balak's like, okay, all right, I, I hear what you're saying. So Balaam ta Balak takes Balaam to three locations. So I was thinking in here, I was looking in this, and I started doing some math, and I'm like, somebody else got taken to three locations too after the number 40. And I'm like, dang. Like, is he giving us prophecy and saying that this is going to happen again? Like, like, I'm sure there's about five messages wrapped up into that, but Balaam takes them to three places. A couple of them are on high. It's the same thing that Satan did to Jesus. Basically tempting them, right? Trying to tempt God. And similar to the 40 days in the wilderness that Jesus was in, we're at the tail end of 40 years in the wilderness. So, Definitely some similarities there. Three times they went out to these different locations. They built altars on the God. They sacrificed seven oxen and seven rams. It's a number of completion. They're at the end of their journey. An exchange happens each time with Balaam and Balak. Balak stating, I have done all this for you as you said, building the altars, right? He's given him financial gain at this point. He's given him some wealth. He's might have even given him a position of authority. I've given you all this, and each time, Balaam actually holds his ground. And he comes back. And he says that I'm going to issue a blessing. So they do the altar. Balak and his people stay with the altar and the burnt sacrifices. He goes and speaks to God, comes back. Balaam's like, okay, great, great. We're going to go ahead and curse these people. I'm going to be safe. And Balaam goes, and God has blessed these people. And he's losing his mind. He's like, are you kidding me? Like, i just done all this. And this happens three times. And he keeps taking them to different places. Like, if he does it again, that it's more of a sacrifice for God. The connection isn't getting made. It's, it's almost how stupid the lost can be. When Bill says, you know, I witness and witness, and they like don't even get it. You know, I've done that too. It's like it goes right over. And I'm like, dang, you told me like you were a Christian. And they're just not getting it. That's the same. Balak is literally asking a man of God to curse God's people. It's just how deranged sometimes people can, can be in the misunderstanding of God's word and how the whole thing works. So he goes through it. They, they, they have their discussions. They have their talk. Balak's, Balak's trying to put a guilt trip on them. You're supposed to be cursing these people. 
And Balaam can't do anything about it. I can't curse whom God won't curse because God is not a man that can lie like man can. That's what he states in 23.19. He can't go back on his promise to Jacob. God promised to bless Jacob's seed in Genesis 12. And he can't go back on that. And God commanded the blessing on Israel. Israel, God is still blessing them. God is still keeping a hedge of protection around them. Changing battery out. Good. Cool. So that's the key takeaway to keep in mind with all of this, which is why we can have hope as we fall short, as we all will, that God still is doing things. He's not letting us just run free and Satan out there destroying us and whipping us around. You've got them down here in the plains of Moab, right? They're, they're act, some of them are acting out. They've, they've had all of these problems over 40 years. And here in the back, the back scene, right, that Israel doesn't even know, just like a lot of times we don't even know. We don't know all of the stuff that God is doing for us. I know all of us here today pray the many, many thanks for grace and for mercy that's poured out on us because we know it's happening. We know so many millions and millions of things that are going our way even though some things aren't. And, and, and that even his anger kindled against Israel and the things that they're doing. He blessed them. And he had Balaam come out and say that they're blessed. So he doesn't, even though they're disobedience, he doesn't get cursed. The problem is this. Balaam had a good thing going. He was kind of on track, right? Well, if you read ahead in Numbers 31.16, Balaam starts talking about how he can trip him up. He teaches Balak how to uh, uh, get God's people to fall. How to get him to trespass against God by whoremongering, worshiping idols, and essentially falling into pagan traps. And that those that fall we're dealt with by God because the wages of sin is death. It has to happen. There's no way around it. I want to go to three places real quick before we end. The New Testament talks about Balaam, and it is not in a good light. So we see that there were some positive things that were done here, but then he sells out. He probably, after getting used to all this money and getting this stuff from Balak, right? He's like, oh man, I'm running a little low on some cash, right? I need to set me up for the rest of my life. So in order to do that and to get this place of high authority, he says, hey, you know what? I couldn't get this cursing for you, but let me tell you about some of their weaknesses. Let me tell you about how they like the ladies, right? They come and just ravage countries, right? Let me tell you about the envious living. Let me tell you about, you know... They love to eat. You can literally take the sacrifices and feed it to them because if it's good meat, they're going to eat it, right? They, ought, they were complaining about bread and water for 40 years. They'll eat anything, right? So you, you've essentially got that happening, and that's that stumbling block. So in Revelations 2.14, if you want to turn there, So here, we've got John talking about, but I have a few things against thee, in 2.14, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit fornication or sexual immorality. That doesn't seem like a very good light. He had a good thing going for him. He could have had a different story. He could have had a different ending. But it gets worse. Alright? So this is in Revelations. And we all know, you know, as we're going into the end times, don't be a stumbling block. That's what that message is from John there. Don't be an idiot like Balaam. And if you turn to Jude 11, there is only one book, so it's just Jude 11. Woe unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain. That's not a good start. 
and ran greedily after heir of the of Balaam for reward or financial gain and perished in the rebellion of Korah. So this running after money, Bill had mentioned it, I don't know, a couple, three, four months ago. I had to talk with him because I was fearing that I was getting close to maybe doing that. In sales, there are certain opportunities from a job standpoint that, you know, I've had to say no to positions that are over 200 grand a year. Very enticing. The problem is, is I know I'd be gone a lot. The problem is that I'd be missing my family. The problem is, is that I know, given my past, that I'm probably going to be in some sorrowful mode and I'm going to need to go have some drinks that night to go ahead and calm myself down, right? To be able to go back to the room and sleep because I'm missing my kids. And then what does the tempter do, right? The tempter is going to put people around you when you're out in places like this. Now, thank God I didn't fall and do anything stupid. But the, the temptation is there nonetheless. I had to take less. I had to go down a different road that I didn't want to go down because patience is not a good friend of mine. I am not good at waiting. I want it now. I've had it now for a long time. And, and at the end of 2020, you know, the Lord opened my eyes, visited me, showed me, don't be a stumbling block. And it really, along with some other things, changed the way that I looked at it. I took positions that were much less. And I didn't know how it was going to end. I didn't know if it was going to be good, bad. And through that patience, and through a year and a half, He's put me in a place and brought me out of being traveling. My son Levi never knew me being home on Saturdays. I was always at home on the weekend I had Luke. He never knew me to be home on all nights. God put me in a position where I work from home four out of five days a week. Yeah, I answer the phone a lot, but I'm literally at home every night. I'm at home every weekend. So something that I thought was terrible, what's going on? How come this is happening? It looks like a cursing, and it isn't. It's a blessing. And then he ends up turning it on, and I'm doing things in a company that is the largest solar company in the world, and that I shouldn't be doing in Peoria. I shouldn't be beating people like Miami and Dallas and Houston and California. Crazy things are happening that, that shouldn't be happening. And he's now got me to a point that looks like it's going to be better than I've ever been in my entire life. And normally I mess that up. I go do what I think needs to be done. And I try to have patience and I'm getting better and i got a long ways to go. But, but, but that is... Though, though just reading Jude 11 here recently is exactly what I've gone through. Last place I want to go is 2 Peter 2.15 and 16. In here Peter talks about which, I, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray following the way of Balaam the son of Bozar, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumbass speaking with the man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. It literally took a dumbass to stop him. Pun intended. I don't want to have to wait until my dog talks to me. Right? I don't want to let it go that far. Balaam was so lust drunk that that's what it took. Our desires in line. I'll end with this. It is an absolute fact, an absolute fact, the more time that you spend with God and act on what He is telling you to, the more fulfilled your life will be. It is it is something that you can never, ever lose out on. It's just like outgiving God. You can never outgive God. I have one quick story I wasn't going to tell, but, but it just popped in my head. So my first bonus that I got 
I didn't tithe it. We we were coming out of some some uh, financial difficulty. You know, when you build your life thinking you're always going to make that, and you decide to cut that in half, things change, right? You you start living a different way. You you start trying to be more modest. You start trying to realize there's certain things you don't need, uh, and that that time with family is worth, uh, you know, ten million dollars, right? And uh, so I didn't, but I made a promise to him, and I said that no matter what I earn for a bonus next time, I'm I'm giving the ten percent off the top. I didn't tell Lauren about it uh, when when I first made that pact, and uh, all of a sudden crazy things started happening. I started breaking records and doing things in this company they ain't never seen, and it's a new territory. And they've been around, they're in 38 states. There's 110 territories. And within about three weeks after making that promise to God, I was on the absolute top. Everyone in that company knows who I am now. They all had to look up Peoria because they thought it was Peoria, Arizona. But uh, they had no idea where the heck that was. I was like, come on, Richard Pryor's from there. But, um, but not only does everyone know, but, but Lauren knows for, for a handful of years, I've been wanting to get out there and go work with businesses to build and expand and grow them. And uh, I got reached out uh, mid last week for an interview, meeting with the, uh, interviewing with the vice presidents of the company uh, to um, see about potentially changing the way a billion dollar a year company goes to market with my sales system that I use. Because on top of that, of growing to the top and God timesing my bonus by five to have it be one of the biggest bonuses that a TSM has ever been paid out in the company's history, to potentially going to do what, what, what I would dream to do. And uh, it's again, it just, it just reiterates that you cannot outgive him, that if you have that patience, that if you do wait on him, that he will come through. So, last thing is this. Input equals output. In sales, we always say it's a proven fact. Whatever you put into it and honing your craft and getting better will be a direct reflection of your output. And I think it's the same with God. Yes, you cannot forget grace and mercy, but I lived on grace and mercy way too long. There has got to be input. So he can use you for output. He's got to prepare you. Just as I believe that it says that in this story multiple times, go and say what I say, not what you say. I think that's a direct reflection of scripture memorization. I just heard David Jeremiah talking about that as well. Scripture, scripture memorization on the things that you know people struggle with is a great way, I think, to get in and to open them up. To the see the see the Lord, and with that, I'll close in prayer. Lord Father Almighty God, we humbly come before you. We thank you so much for all that you do for us each and every day. We thank you for the doors that you open and you show us the light to to go through those doors, and for the doors that you close. May we not fight you on those closed doors. May we not try to kick those doors in but we accept what you've put in front of us and we continue to come to you on our knees, on our face, ask for forgiveness of our sins, fill us with the power of the Holy Spirit, take the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding that you give us and let us sow it into our lives and share it with others. Uh, we thank you for all we do. We do all things for your glory. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Zach, thankfully, will help with closing him. Good message, huh? Amen. Amen. All right. Let's sing. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join tears with Jesus as we travel this side. 
For I'm part of the family, the family of God. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. As Patty says, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Great job. Thanks, man. Appreciate it.